Hello, fellow teachers. Welcome to Teaching with Thou. Thank you for letting me be a part of your scripture study or your lesson prep this week. My goal is to help you to either teach or study the scriptures with more relevancy and power. And this week, we are going to be studying, for the most part, 2 Nephi chapters 20 through 25. At least that's the assignment in the Come Follow Me manual. I'll explain in a moment. But remember, teachers, if you're interested in getting access to the materials and resources that I produce to help teachers reduce their preparation time, increase their confidence in the classroom, and create edifying classroom experiences, go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to those resources. Now, if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. So as usual, I apologize for this. I'm not completely following the suggested chapter coverage in the way that the Come Follow Me manual does. For example, you already know that I included 2 Nephi chapter 25 as part of last week's study, which is part of this week's chapters. And then there are going to be some sections of scripture that we take a look at this week that were part of last week's suggested chapters. I hope that's okay with you, but I've just found that the thematic approach that I use to teach the Isaiah chapters works well for me and and makes it easier for my students to understand this sometimes perplexing portion of the Book of Mormon. Before we begin, let's review where we've been so far. You might remember that last week I showed you the following chart that highlights the different themes that we want to cover in the Isaiah chapters. Isaiah lived at a time when the house of Israel was under the threat of military attack. And so much of his imagery and his symbolism reflects that reality. He uses that setting to describe and prophesy the spiritual attack that Lucifer has plotted against all of us and God's kingdom throughout Earth's history. Remember that Isaiah talks about his time, Christ's time, and our time all at the same time. So, We've already covered Satan's attack, our defense, and our offense last week. This week, we're going to continue our look at the conflict by focusing on the winners and the losers in this contest, this war, and the captains, the team captains, the generals of both sides of this war. So, Our object for this lesson is going to be one of those foam, we're number one hands that you sometimes see at football or basketball games. If you'd like to purchase one of these as an object lesson, I'll provide a link to an inexpensive one that you can get on Amazon. For an icebreaker, I just like to ask my students if they've ever had the experience of their team winning a big championship. And if they have, what was that like? And I'd take out the the little fuzzy hand as an object lesson. How did it feel at the end of that game? Now, I've had that experience a few times in my life, not many, but since we just had the Super Bowl, I do remember when my team finally won that big event. I've been a Denver Broncos fan ever since I was a little kid, and we lived in the Denver area. And it was an exciting thing to see them win the Super Bowl in 98 and 99, and then again in 2016. Now, it's been a while, and who knows how long it'll be before it happens again, but those were really exciting years. It was good to be a Broncos fan during those years, to be number one. And if you can relate to that feeling, this lesson will probably resonate with you even more. In fact, if you've ever been on the team, a player on the team that won a big championship, and that's even better, this lesson will mean even more to you because that's the spirit of it. We're going to talk about winners and losers today. So let me present you with a hypothetical situation. Let's say that it's the beginning of a championship game, a game that matters, where the stakes couldn't be any higher. And funnily enough, 
you've been given the choice to play for the side that you want to play for. You get to choose your team. And you're about to make your choice when, by some strange twist of fate, a friend of yours who you completely trust, and I know this sounds far-fetched, but work with me here. He says, I've traveled through time. I've come from the future, and I've seen how the game is going to end. This team, this side, is the one that wins. The outcome is assured. If that were the situation, if you knew for sure which team was going to win, which side would you choose? Or let's take a look at it another way. Let's say it's a war, and you get to choose which side you fight for. And again, someone from the future comes to warn you and tells you which side is going to win. It's going to be a massacre. <laughs> which side would you choose to fight for? Wouldn't the choice be obvious? I would imagine that most individuals are going to want to choose the winning side of any conflict or contest. Nobody likes to lose. Winning is so much more enjoyable. Keep that in mind as we study today, because that's the situation that we are in here in the latter days. There's a war going on right now. The war between good and evil. The contest between Team Zion and Team Babylon. As Lehi taught us back in 2 Nephi chapter 2, we are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. That pretty much sums up today's lesson, to be honest. It's those two sides and their leaders that we're going to focus on. And God has sent us prophets, ancient and modern, who have had the opportunity to travel through time, so to speak, to see as seers the future, the outcome. And what's the message that they're bringing us? We know how this war ends. We know the final score. We know who's going to win and who's going to lose in this battle. So the question for us is, do we believe them? Do we trust their vision and their counsel? Are we willing to choose the prophesied winning team, winning army? We're going to approach today's lesson with that in mind. And I've decided that we're going to do this a little out of chronological order, or the order they go in the chapters. Because we're going to actually start with the losers first. The Isaiah chapters kind of do the opposite. Uh, he starts with the winners and ends with the losers. But I just prefer to end on a positive note instead of a negative one. So let's begin by looking at the losing team. What is the fate of Team Babylon? We're going to find the answer to that question in 2 Nephi 12, 9-22, and all of chapter 23. And I don't like to dwell too long on this section, so a quick activity that you could do is a fill-in-the-blank challenge. This encourages your students to quickly scan through the scriptures to find the major message. So you tell them that you're going to display an incomplete phrase on the screen, or you can just do this verbally as well, but that you're going to leave out a word or two from the phrase. Their job is to be the first person to find the verse that the phrase is found in and identify the missing word or words. And I usually like to throw out a small treat to the person who finds it first. So we're going to start in 2 Nephi 12. All of the answers to these phrases are found somewhere in verses 9 through 22. The lofty looks of man shall be blank. Humbled from verse 11. The haughtiness of men shall be made blank. Low, in verse 17. And I may point out that all throughout those verses there, you see example after example of tall or high things being cut down or brought low. Symbolic. So Isaiah mentions the cedars of Lebanon, the oaks of Bashan, 
big trees, high mountains, hills, high towers, fenced walls, ships of the sea with their big masts, and every single one of those images is bowed down, humbled, or made low. This is what the Lord is going to do to the prideful. Their pride is going to be toppled. Continuing, the idols he shall utterly blank. Abolish, verse 18. A man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which he hath made for himself to worship, to the blanks and to the blanks. to the moles and to the bats. Verse 20. Now, now, why would Isaiah choose those two particular creatures in relation to idols? Now, what do they both have in common? Moles and bats. They're blind. Idols are blind. They offer no vision. They don't help. They're just dumb idols. Stone and wood. Just like our modern idols, things like money, lust, success, popularity, uh, materials, blind. They offer no real or substantial rewards. And I like how those images match up with verse 19. Where will the idols go? Into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth. And where do moles and bats live? in holes and caves, places of darkness, no light. Pretty good description of Satan's idols, isn't it? And lastly, for this chapter, and the majesty of his glory shall blank them. Smite, verse 21. Now we're going to jump to 2 Nephi chapter 23. Uh, chapter 23 is where Isaiah is going to prophesy the historical fall of Babel. But he's going to use that as a metaphor for the fall of the world, or Satan's kingdom. The city of Babylon throughout much of Scripture is symbolic of the world. We saw that most notably in our recent study of the book of Revelation. But Isaiah here, you can see that he's deliberately making this connection. You can compare verses 1 to and 11. And in verse 1, it says that this is the burden of Babylon or the destruction of Babylon. But in verse 11, he doesn't say, and I will punish Babylon, does he? He says, I will punish the world for evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And perhaps the chapter heading sums it up best. The destruction of Babylon is a type of the destruction at the second coming. It will be a day of wrath and vengeance. Babylon, the world, will fall forever. So what's that, what's that day going to be like for the wicked, for, for Team Babylon? And these I'm not going to do in order. You want to make it a little more challenging. So here we go. How will ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a blank from the Almighty. Verse 5, Destruction. I will blank the world. Punish the world. Verse 11. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God blank Sodom and Gomorrah. Overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 18. They shall be blank. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be afraid. Verse 8. For I will destroy her blank. Speedily. Verse 22. He shall blank the sinners. Destroy. Verse 9. All hands be faint and every man's heart shall blank. Melt. Verse 7. Everyone that is proud shall be blank through. Thrust through. Verse 15. The stars of heaven and the constellations 
shall not give their blank. Light. Burst in. So, it's not a pretty picture, is it? And, and there's more in there. Uh, some pretty disturbing descriptions. But just consider some of the words that Isaiah uses here. Humbled. Destroyed. Afraid. Thrust through. Punished. Overthrown. I'm not sure how literal we take this prophecy, but, but the message is clear. Our truth, if I choose Babylon, the world, then I will fall. And historically speaking, this is what happened to the literal Babylon. Isaiah masterfully draws on that future event for him, a past event for us. But it comes true. And Babylon does fall speedily. It is overthrown in one day. This was a city that nobody thought could ever fall. Babylon was huge, the most powerful empire anybody had ever known. It's reported that the walls of the city itself were so thick, so big, that a, a four-horsed chariot could ride along the top of it. That might be a historical exaggeration, but the city was considered impregnable. It's the city that housed the famous Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. It was a very materialistic, rich, prideful, and powerful city. All great descriptions for the world. And you can see why Isaiah would choose it as a symbol. Because likewise for us, it may seem for the righteous that Babylon is winning. Power of the world is very intimidating. I mean, how could our little congregations of believers around the world ever hope to win against such vast influence, dominance? Seems impossible. Just like if you were to ask your average everyday Israelite at the time of Isaiah, if they felt that Babylon could ever be defeated, they would say, not likely. Babylon? Never. They're too powerful, especially not in one day. It did fall in a day. The Persians found a weakness. Uh, you see, the, the Euphrates River flowed right under the walls of the city. So what did the Persians do? Pretty ingenious. They simply dammed and diverted the flow of the river upstream, which caused the water levels of the river to recede. So when the Babylonians were least expecting it, the Persians snuck under the walls and took control of the city in a day. Therefore, what will be the fate of the world and all of its influence and wealth and authority at the second coming? It will fall in a day, regardless of how powerful it seems now. But what about their leader, though? their king, their team captain, their general. And who would that be? Lucifer, right? He's what I would refer to as the biggest loser. And what is Satan's fate? This being that brought so much pain and suffering and violence and hatred to our world. What does the future hold for the devil? Chapter 24 has the answer. And this is, this is so good. Isaiah really gets uh, a little feisty here with Satan. And I don't think that you need any kind of big activity for this section. I just encourage you to walk your students through this section verse by verse, asking questions and discussing things as you go. We're going to pick it up in verse 4. And it shall come to pass in that day that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. Babylon is the world, then the king of Babylon would be Satan. And we take up a proverb against him. A proverb in this sense is a taunt or a satirical song. That's what the footnote in the actual book of Isaiah says. It, it, that means it's like when your team is up 50 to zero and the crowd starts to sing 
a taunt or a satirical song like na 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 hey hey goodbye you ever ever heard that in a game or sometimes i've heard the fans of a team chant overrated overrated you ever had that happen that's the spirit of these next verses this is the in your face lucifer you've lost song and what are the words of that satirical song and say how hath the oppressor ceased the golden city ceased the lord hath broken the staff of the wicked the scepters of the rulers he who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth the whole earth is at rest and is quiet they break forth into singing yea the fir trees rejoice at thee and also the cedars of lebanon saying since thou art laid down no feller is come up against us so everybody's rejoicing that satan is gone this being who ruled the world with anger and persecution is now the one that's going to be persecuted and he's gone the lord has ridded the world of his influence and we like trees begin to rejoice because nobody is going to come and try to chop us down anymore no feller right somebody who chops down trees so we rejoice we rest and we sing but what happens to lucifer verse 9 hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming it stirreth up the dead for thee even all the chief ones of the earth it hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nation. So Satan is sent to hell, outer darkness. And who is there to greet him, to welcome him? All the evil leaders of history, the chief ones of the earth. So this is kind of fun. Uh, who do you picture might be there to greet Satan? Now, I've got a few ideas. and In fact, I'll put some pictures up and you see if you can guess who these people are. Some of the people that I might imagine would be there to welcome Satan into hell. <laughs> so I picture Hitler, Mao, Genghis Khan, King Noah from the Book of Mormon, Caligula, Osama bin Laden, Stalin, uh, the Pharaoh at the time of Moses, and I threw in a few others, and yes, I know, I put Voldemort in there just for fun. But imagine they all line up to welcome Satan into hell. And are they sympathetic? Are they friendly to him, the, the, their leader? Nope. Verse 10. And they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Oh, poor Satan. You couldn't hold on to your kingdom either. You lost your power just like we did. 11. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave. The noise of thy vials, violins, is not heard. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. So there's no party to welcome him or celebrate his existence. And instead of the red carpet, they roll out a carpet of worms for him. Instead of a royal robe, a robe of worms around his shoulders. What do they say? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. So what part of the plan of salvation is Isaiah referring to here? This would be a reference to the pre-mortal world. Remember, Satan had such high aspirations. He was filled with pride. He demanded the throne of God for his alternate plan. But instead of a throne, He'll inherit a pit. 
instead of heaven? Hell. Which, you know, I've always thought that this was interesting, that, that Satan's desire was to be like God. Give me thy throne. Give me thy glory. I want to have your power. Guess what? Lucifer would have eventually gotten what he wanted if he had decided not to rebel. If he had followed God's plan, he would have received the opportunity to become like God because that's the destiny of the righteous of mankind. But isn't that just like Satan? I want what I want right now, and I don't want to have to work for it. I don't want all that effort and sacrifice and testing and struggles. I just want the good stuff, the blessings, without the exertion. And you know, most of Satan's temptations are like that. He, he tempts us to do the same kind of thing. You can have money without work. So gamble or steal. You can have sexual pleasure without commitment. So fornicate, indulge in pornography. You can have the good grade without the study. So cheat. You can commit the sin, but suffer no consequences. So lie about what you've done. And that's how Satan works. Well, now he's going to be at the receiving end of that equation, of that great lie that you can get away with it and have no consequence. But eventually they catch up with you and they will for him at this point. And then we, we get this scathing verdict. What are people going to say when they finally see Lucifer for what he really is? Verse 16. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and shall consider thee and say, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof? open not the house of his prisoners? So can you picture that moment? People narrowly looking on him, narrowing their eyes with a look of incredulity and saying, this, this is the being that caused so much trouble and heartache and pain in the world and, and in my life. This, this worm-covered loser? How did I ever fall for his influence? His tricks. Is this the man? Verse 18. All the kings of the nations, yea, all of them, lie in glory. Every one of them in his own house. We're going to pause here for a minute. What's he talking about there? Many powerful leaders over time have built great monuments, mausoleums, tombs, grave sites so that they would continue to be remembered even after they died. The only way to become immortal is to build something that will last through the ages. My body may crumble and turn to dust, but my memorial, my tomb of stone, will be forever. I'll make it impossible for me to be forgotten. Now, can you think of some examples of this? Or, for fun, can you name these famous tombs? You could do this activity as a quick handout, if you prefer. And no, I'm not saying that all of the people who built these tombs and monuments were evil, right? The, these are just examples of, of tombs that were built to remember powerful people or leaders. What are these? Uh, the first one, probably the most famous and the oldest, the Great Pyramid of Khufu. We still know his name. Uh, this is Lenin's tomb. Kind of a more disturbing one, right? He had his body embalmed, and you can go and still look at his body. It's really kind of creepy, but uh, that's Lenin's tomb in Moscow. Uh, the Temple of the Great Jaguar in Tikal, Guatemala. Uh, this is a fascinating one. These are the, the terracotta soldiers of Emperor Qin in China. Just a, a huge entire army of, of soldiers, of terracotta soldiers, of statues, to accompany him into the afterlife. 
Uh, this is the Taj Mahal. And then you've got uh, Hadrian's Mausoleum. It's a, a famous building in Rome. Well, thousands of tourists flock to these sites every day to admire these amazing works of architecture or, or to honor those who they represent. All the kings of the nations lie in glory, every one of them in his own house. So the question that Isaiah is posing here is, will Satan get one of these, the king of Babylon? Will there be a monument or a memorial to him when his kingdom falls and crumbles to dust? Verse 19 and 20 hold the answer. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and the remnant of those that are slain thrust through with the sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renewed. So, no, no monument, no memorial, no sunburned tourists snapping selfies around his grave. Nobody sitting around admiring what his ambition accomplished. Tell you what, uh, after the second coming, nobody is going to be reminiscing about the good old days when Satan was around. He'll be forgotten. An unpleasant memory from the past. You know, that kind of reminds me of what happened to Hitler. I visited Berlin a couple of years ago, and uh, the tour guide pointed out the site where Hitler's bunker was, the place where he died, committed suicide. Do they have a memorial there, a tomb, a monument to Hitler's memory? Now, it's a parking lot right next to some apartment buildings. The German government doesn't want anybody creating a shrine or honoring Hitler in any way. <laughs> Reminds me of verse 20. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land, slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renewed. Uh, certainly the German people were also victims of Hitler's evil. And that's Lucifer's story all over, isn't it? Truth, Lucifer will lose. Maybe, maybe we should just call him that. Lose supper. <laughs> so to add to our previous truth, if I choose Babylon, the world, and her king, Satan, then I will fall and I will lose much. So why would I ever want to choose him as my team captain, as my general? And no, I don't think that there are many individuals out there that are going to consciously make that choice. I mean, who consciously chooses Satan as a leader? But it's his city that sometimes deceives us, his team. It's Babylon that often calls with all of her enticements, with her hanging gardens and riches and pride and materialism and sensuality and seeming power. Let's not be fooled. Babylon's going to fall, and so will its king. Don't pick the losing team. And now, let's spend the rest of our time on the positive, then. We've, we've got to take a look at the alternative. If Satan is the biggest loser, who would you expect the biggest winner to be? The other team captain that we can choose. Jesus Christ is the biggest winner. And Isaiah has a lot to say about him. You remember what Nephi told us back in 1 Nephi 19, 23? One of the purposes of studying Isaiah is to more fully persuade us to believe in Christ. I hope that our study here has that effect. And a fun way to begin a discussion of what Isaiah teaches us about Jesus Christ uh, would be to see if you could complete these famous titles or nicknames. 
Uh, people throughout history or sports figures or leaders are sometimes given titles, special names that we use to remember them. So can you name these famous ones? Alexander the blank. The great. Ivan the terrible. Abraham Lincoln was known as honest Abe. Elvis was the blank of rock and roll. The king of rock and roll. Uh, Babe Ruth, he's got quite a few. If you've ever seen The Sandlot, you know them all. He was the Sultan of Swat, the Colossus of Clout, the Great Bambino. About Michael Jordan, he was known as Blank Jordan, Air Jordan. And then Tom Brady is simply known as the Goat, right? Which when I first heard that, I didn't get it. It's like, why would you want to be called a goat? Well, it's an acronym. Greatest of all time. Oh, what are Christ's titles? His nicknames, so to speak. You're going to find a great list of them. Some of them. In 2 Nephi chapter 19, verse 6. What's he going to be known for? For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Great titles. Now, if you wish to help your students understand the significance of some of those titles, you could share this great quote from Elder Holland. The fact that the government would eventually be upon Jesus Christ's shoulders affirms what all the world will one day acknowledge, that he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and will one day rule over the earth and his church in person. As wonderful counselor, he will be our mediator, our intercessor, defending our cause in the courts of heaven. Mighty God, conveys something of the power of God, his strength, omnipotence, and unconquerable influence. Everlasting Father underscores the fundamental doctrine that Christ is a Father, creator of worlds without number, the Father of restored physical life through the resurrection, the Father of eternal life for his spiritually begotten sons and daughters, and the one acting for the Father Elohim, through divine investiture of authority. Aren't those great titles? And, and which one of those is your favorite and why? My favorite one is wonderful. Jesus is a wonderful Savior. Why is he called wonderful? Well, that reminds me of the wonderful Wizard of Oz, that, that old movie. Do you remember why they called him wonderful? There's the little song in the movie. We're off to see the wizard, the wonderful wizard of Oz, because, 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 because of the wonderful things he does. That's the same reason we call Jesus wonderful. Because of the wonderful things he does. Let's take a look at some of those wonderful things. Wonderful things about his character, wonderful things about his purpose. And I do wish that we could just take a couple of hours and I could walk you through verse by verse, chapter 17 through 22. We can't do that here, and neither can you as a teacher. So I just like to pull out some of the major messages about Christ in those chapters. Because if you read them, Isaiah discusses the major military threats that Israel is facing and will face. But throughout that, he consistently keeps referring to the Messiah. The main message of those chapters, most of those chapters, is don't be afraid of these worldly kingdoms. Choose God. Choose the future Messiah. Choose the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings. Look to him. And choose righteousness. And then you don't need to worry about those other powers. 
from the confederacy of Syria and Ephraim, it's going to come to naught. Uh, Assyria, they're going to flow all the way to the neck. He says that in one of the verses, uh, like a flood, but, but it's not going to drown you. Assyria would take over all the areas surrounding Jerusalem. They take city after city, getting closer and closer. But Jerusalem does not fall. That's the, the story in Second Kings with King Hezekiah. Because the people are righteous. Because they repent. So Assyria goes back home. Right, They're smitten by God. And then Babylon will eventually fall. They, they do overtake Jerusalem, but a remnant returns. Uh, the Israelites are going to eventually return and, and reestablish Jerusalem and Israel. As, as long as they're righteous, as long as they choose the Messiah, they win. All these other worldly kingdoms are going to fall and crumble, but God's kingdom and its king are going to rule forever. That's a very simplified summary of those chapters. But what do we learn about Jesus from these following verses? And you could turn this into a team challenge, if you like, for an activity. Divide your students into teams of two to four members and hand each of them the following paper. Their task is to write down as many things as they can, separate things that they learn about Jesus. How many different things can they identify about the wonderful Savior? And you give them a time limit. Uh, five minutes will probably do. And then you count them up and see which team found the most. The verses that you would refer to, 2 Nephi 17, 14 and 15, 18, verses 13 and 14, 19, verses 2 through 5, and 7. And then chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. And to give you a sense of the different kinds of things that they might write, uh, allow me to walk you through these references, just highlighting what I see. So in chapter 17, verses 14 through 15, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and to choose the good. What do we learn about Jesus there? His birth will be miraculous. He will be born of a virgin. He would be of godly origin. His name will be called Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. I love that name for Jesus. We have a God that walked among us, became as one of us. His house is with us. Our, our temples are in our communities, our nations. Our God isn't up there or out there. He's with us, walking beside us, lifting us up, providing us with strength. We can be equally yoked with him. Butter and honey shall he eat. That just means that he's going to be poor, right? That he would come from humble circumstances. Those were the only foods available to the poor at times. So the king of kings would not be born in a palace, but in a stable. He wouldn't come as a great military leader, but as a humble carpenter and a teacher. He wouldn't come to destroy Roman soldiers, but death and hell. And he's going to know how to refuse the evil and choose the good. Jesus would be the only mortal to ever live who always chose good and always refused evil. 2 Nephi 18, verses 13 and 14. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And this one may require a little more explanation. The word that stands out to me most is sanctuary. Jesus Christ can be our sanctuary. Sanctuary is a place of refuge or a safety from danger. And Jesus Christ offers the righteous sanctuary. Maybe, maybe you've seen the Disney movie, uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. 
At the beginning of that movie, Quasimodo's mother is being chased through the streets of Paris, and she runs up to the cathedral doors and shouts out what? Sanctuary! Sanctuary! I need help! Can you offer me protection? Well, that's what Jesus can do for us. He offers us sanctuary from sin, from temptation, from pain, from death, from hell. However, if I don't look to Christ with fear, respect, then he may become a stone of stumbling to me, or a rock of offense, a gin, a snare, a trap. I get to choose, though, which of those things Christ is for me. If I don't respect him, his gospel, his commandments, I may stumble. These things become an offense to me. When I don't turn to the Lord of hosts, I'm condemned by his gospel rather than saved by it. 2 Nephi chapter 9, uh, verses 2 through 5, and then verse 7. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. And then we already covered verse 6, all of those excellent titles. But now verse 7. Of the increase of government and peace there is no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So what do we learn about Christ here? He offers light to those who walk in darkness. The light of his love, his truth, his guidance, comfort. He increases joy. What kind of joy? Harvest time joy. A time of plenty and celebration. Winning a war kind of joy, where you divide the spoils amongst the victims. He's a savior that removes burdens, the burdens of guilt, the burdens of persecution, the burdens of trial. He brings peace. His leadership, his government is a peaceful one, and he establishes his kingdom on the principle of justice. So he's fair. And then probably my favorite section, 2 Nephi 21 verses 1 through 5. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness, shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteous shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Well, there's, there's a lot uh, from those verses. It's a great description of Jesus Christ's leadership. His style of authority, as opposed to Satan's. So he'll have the spirit of the Lord with him. He's wise. He's understanding. He's willing to counsel us. He's a strong leader, mighty, smart, respectful to God the Father. These next verses again, understanding and respect. And he'll be our judge. But what kind of judge? He's not going to judge by the outward appearance, but by the heart. He'll judge with righteousness, meekness, and and justice to the wicked. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of judge, the kind of being that I would prefer judging me. He's not going to lead by intimidation or fear, but he's going to lead by righteousness and faith. Now, uh, take a look at that list really quite impressive, isn't it? And now recall what we learned about Satan 
the king of Babylon, being that was prideful, that only thought about himself, that didn't care for his people or those who chose to follow him. It's going to descend into hell and be covered in worms and forgot. Which of the two team captains or war generals would you want to follow? Who would you trust? Who would you be willing to go to battle for? Take it to heart. Which of the qualities of Christ do you love most and why? Please share. And if you wished to sink that message of Christ's divine character just a little deeper into the hearts of your students, you might consider showing the following video. It's called The Prince of Peace. And it's very well done, uh, very powerful. And it reviews many of the qualities and characteristics that we just talked about here. While they watch, have them consider the following question. Why would I want to choose Christ as my leader? So now for our final section of study, the winners. Saved this one for last. Take out your little furry hand here. For those that choose Christ as their leader, for those that choose to play for Team Zion, fight for God's army, what's going to be their reward? There's a famous war saying from history. To the victor go the blank. The spoils. To the victor goes the spoils. The rewards. So what are the rewards for winning this game? For winning this war? And I want you to find them. In chapter 21, verses 6 through 16, and then all of chapter 22 which is a really short chapter, but, but I would label that chapter the victory song. You know, when your team wins, you may sometimes sing a, a victory song. Uh, chapter 22 is the ancient Israelite version of We Are the Champions. So look, look for the evidence of the spoils of victory within the words of that celebrated refrain. And the search activity that I would probably do for this, this section is very open-ended. I just simply call it questions, comments, thoughts, or feelings. And I invite my students to read those verses and then come up with at least one of those things from something that they said. They should be able to come up with at least one. Do they have a question that they'd like to pose to you or the class? Do they have a comment that they would like to make? Is there a thought that they'd like to share from what they study? Or what was their overall feeling that they had as they studied? Now, the thing is, is they get to choose where they take this. So give them a good five minutes to study and then take as much time as you like, allowing them to share or ask questions. If you wanted to add a little element of fun to it, you could find a way to randomly select the people that get to share or make a comment. One of my favorite ways of doing this is with cards. So I'm a magician. And I know that you can purchase an entire deck of blank cards because I've used those before in magic tricks. But the purpose of this blank deck is that it provides you with the chance to write the names of each of your students on the cards. And then you or somebody else in the class picks a card, any card. Whoever's name is selected gets to share. I call it the deck of destiny. But for some of my students who don't like to share, uh, sometimes they refer to it as the deck of doom because it means they have to say something if they get chosen. But it works well and adds an interesting element to the lesson. If you're interested in purchasing a deck of blank cards, I'll put a link to one that you can purchase on Amazon. I buy a couple of these every year, and I use them for all of my classes. Now, to help you to be better prepared to answer questions about these verses or to have a discussion about them, I'd like to give you just a few of my own personal thoughts. Uh, so look closely at the pairs of animals in verses 6 through 8. The wolf and the lamb, the leopard and the kid, the calf and the young lion, the bear and the cow. Now, I know we usually picture the lion and the lamb lying down together, but we get that wrong. It's the wolf and the lamb, and the lion and the fat one. Well, what kind of relationships are these? What, what kind of pairing is going on here? These are predator-prey relationships. 
But when Christ overthrows Satan's kingdom, there's not going to be any more predator prey anymore. And in verse 8, we've got innocent children playing around poisonous snakes. So what, what's Isaiah saying here about millennial or celestial conditions? I know that we almost always interpret that as literal. And I believe it is literal. Uh, there, there will be peace in the animal kingdom. But more importantly, I think he's saying that there's not going to be any more predator-prey relationships among mankind. No more strong, powerful nations conquering and dominating smaller or weaker ones. Uh, no Nazi Germanys gobbling up the Netherlands and Poland's. No Russia trying to gobble up Ukraine. No more rich preying on the poor. No more physically strong exploiting the weak. No more abuser preying on the abused. And like the child and the poisonous snakes, the deceitful and cunning are going to no longer poison the innocent. The con man won't swindle the senior out of their retirement savings. The sexual predator won't take advantage of the trusted. The intelligent won't be able to deceive the naive. It's going to be a time of peace and assurance. Because, verse 9, the world is going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Sounds amazing, doesn't it? Verse 10 through 12, talk of the completion of the gathering of Israel. A gathering of God's people from all nations. Nobody's left out. He speaks of the remnant, the outcasts, the dispersed of Judah. All are going to be brought together in one from the islands of the sea and the four corners of the earth even. Now, President Nelson has spoken a lot about the gathering of Israel. It reminded us that it's the most important work that we can be engaged in in the latter days. Well, one day, that work is going to be finished. All, right? all of Christ's disciples, his covenant people, are going to be gathered to his ensign, his standard of truth. So if you have ever engaged in missionary work or temple work, you know that the task of taking the gospel into all the world and sounding it in every ear, or the task of doing temple ordinances for every person that ever lived, may seem overwhelming and huge and monumental as to be impossible. One day, that work will be complete. And the great Jehovah shall say, the work is done. And then what will we experience? Verse 10, rest. And that rest shall be glorious. Because it's the kind of rest that comes after finishing a very demanding, yet fulfilling job. Now look at verse 13. The envy of Ephraim shall depart. And then later, Ephraim shall not envy Judah. What's he talking about there? What was the envy of Ephraim? There was something that the kingdom of Judah had within its borders that was a huge and difficult loss for the people of the ten tribes when the kingdom was split into two under the reign of King Rehoboam, Solomon's son. It was the temple. Okay, uh, uh, Judah had the temple in Jerusalem. Well, why won't Ephraim envy them anymore. And this, this is just my interpretation. Because there are going to be temples everywhere. No need for envy anymore. All the nations are going to get their own temples, all peoples. And that, that's already happening. Uh, there are temples all over the world, even out on the little islands of the sea. Temples are going to continue to be built too. Uh, worldwide, until the second coming. No more envy. Uh, verses 14 through 16 is a promise that no nation or people will be able to stop the work of the Lord or the gathering of his people. All obstacles are going to be removed. There's going to be no more nations shutting their doors to missionary work. No antis standing in the way of the truth rolling forward. The way is going to be opened, like the Red Sea parted before the children of Israel a highway through the impediments and stumbling blocks that the enemies of truth have placed in our way for ages. They're going to be gone. And then we've got the victory song of chapter 22. It's so good. If you want a good modern-day counterpart to this song, 
hymn number three, Now Let Us Rejoice, would be appropriate to sing here. It's the same sentiment, that same exultant and energetic spirit. When all that was promised, the saints will be given, and none will molest them from morn until eve. And earth will appear as the garden of Eden. And Jesus will say to all Israel, come home. So we're going to praise the Lord in that day. And we're going to all feel of his comfort. His anger is going to be turned away. We'll receive our salvation. No more death, no more temptation, no more sin, pain, war, or fear. With joy, we'll drink of the living water from the wells of salvation forever. We'll be happy. A measure of happiness that we have yet to experience in this life. We'll praise his name forever as we declare his doings. And I love that phrase in verse 5. He hath done excellent things. Good question to ask there would be, what excellent things has he done for you? And then as verse 6 tells us, the Holy One of Israel will be in the midst of us. We'll get to meet him the Lord Jehovah, our strength and our song, in the flesh. Can you imagine that moment? We're we're all going to get to have a third Nephi 11 kind of experience where he's going to say, come forth, feel the tokens of my sacrifice, the marks in my side, my hands and my feet. And and one by one, we're going to go forth and witness and worship our captain, our general, our Savior. Doesn't that sound wonderful, excellent, amazing? Our truth then that we've been building little by little all throughout this lesson. I know that we tend to think that Isaiah's writings are difficult to understand, but if we dig deep, we realize that his message is really quite simple. If I choose Babylon, the world, and its king, Satan, then I will fall and lose much. If I choose Zion and its king, Jesus, then I will be exalted and gain much. Or, as Lehi put it, we are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men. Or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. So, Our question to consider, to take this to heart, which team am I playing for? Which army am I enlisted in? Which captain am I choosing? If you look down right now at your jersey, at your uniform, what would it say? Team Babylon or Team Zion? And I wouldn't have anybody share their answers to these questions, but Pondering these might help us to determine kind of where we're at, a little self-assessment. In what place do I feel more comfortable, Babylon or Zion, the church or the world? How do I feel when it's time to go to church or the temple or seminary or scripture study or prayer? What kind of language do I use most often? Is it the language of Babylon or the language of Zion? How do I dress or present myself? With the clothing and styles of Babylon or the clothing and styles of Zion? What kind of music do I listen to? What kind of movies? Is it the uplifting messages and melodies of Zion? Or the sensual, violent, and cynical messages and melodies of Babylon? Where do I go for my attitudes, opinions, and beliefs? Do I go to the voices and counsels of Babylon or the voices and counsels of Zion? And we could go on and on with those kinds of questions, but I do feel it's beneficial for us to frequently examine our allegiances and actions. We don't want to get too comfortable in the world. The choice should be clear. And you want to know something else that's really great, really cool about this game, this war. It's not against the rules to change sides. Halfway through the game, you want. If you look down at your jersey or your uniform and you're worried that you may have chosen the wrong team, you can switch jerseys. It's encouraged even. You don't have to remain on the losing side. 
I remember when I played church ball that they had these jerseys that you could switch inside out. And one side was, was white and one side was red. <laughs> well, that's what we can do. We can just look around and take the jersey off, switch it to the other side, and hey, now I'm playing for the other team. People can change. <laughs> we do have to keep one thing in mind, though. This is one of the hard and fast rules of this game. Jesus calls it out as the official. No man can serve two masters. You can't play for both teams. So, so choose liberty. Choose eternal life. Why wouldn't we? So for a, a final, I will go and do. Hopefully, as we've discussed and studied the words of Isaiah, our resolve to be careful about the way we make those choices uh, has deepened and our commitment to Christ has increased. What is one action that you can take this week that would show your Father in heaven you've chosen Zion and Christ? So, have you been persuaded yet by Isaiah to believe more fully in the Lord your Redeemer? I mean, after this presentation by Isaiah, why on earth would anybody in their right mind choose Babylon and her king? Let's choose the winning side. The outcome has already been decided. Let's choose Jesus as our leader, as our team captain. Choose the wonderful, the counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. And he will do excellent things for us. And I bear witness that if we do make that choice, we will never regret it. One day, we're going to sing chapter 22 in triumph and joy. We'll win, and the victory will be glorious. And that's going to conclude our lesson for today. Thank you for going with me on this journey through the chapters of Isaiah. I hope that I accomplished my goal with you, which was to help you to not just get through the Isaiah chapters, but to love them. I'm so grateful that Nephi decided to include these chapters in the Book of Mormon so that we would be compelled to give them our due attention. So if you found any value in this lesson, I just invite you to share it with somebody else that you feel it can help. Thank you for spending this time with me. And as always, get out there and teach with power.